Uh, title is what are the methods and metrics currently being used to assess climate related risks in investment decisions. Today we have uh, three highly distinguished uh, panelists with us uh, to cover this uh, very important question. Rémi Briand, who is uh, head of uh, ESG at MSCI, uh, Olivier uh, Rousseau, who is executive director at Fonds de Reserve pour les Retraites, and uh, Herman Brill, who is the uh, incoming CEO of Arabesque Asset Management and uh, former uh, CIO of the United Nations uh, uh, Pension Funds. So let me briefly take stock of uh, where we are in the Greenswan Conference, uh, or re you know, uh, reporting on some of um, the points that have been made in previous sessions uh, regarding uh, this uh, conference uh, objectives, uh, which is to review uh, where we are uh, in the journey towards greening the financial system. In terms of background, first, we see increasing awareness and intentions um, to invest in ESG products. Uh, however, in spite of this uh, clear uh, direction, investors are complaining uh, that we still lack global standards on the metrics to be used uh, in the disclosure of corporates who need funding from financial markets. In terms of focus for the panel uh, today, we will focus precisely on the choice of metrics that would be the most likely to, to succeed in contributing to the disclosure by corporates with respect to their carbon emissions. We decided to focus on uh, these metrics that relate to the trajectories of carbon emissions uh, and on physical risks that are uh, associated with uh, climate change. It's not to say that uh, other matters like social and uh, governance uh, issues are not important, not at all, uh, nor that uh, within environment issues, um, <coughs> water, forest, biodiversity are um, objectives which uh, would be less important. It's just to focus the discussion on a, a very key issue that relates to uh, a well-defined object, uh, metrics on uh, carbon emissions, and uh, what is at stake in terms of coordinating uh, towards uh, the emergence of, of standards uh, for such uh, metrics. So we will uh, have uh, two main rounds and uh, hopefully within rounds there will be uh, uh, interactions uh, between the panelists as well as uh, possibly questions uh, from uh, participants. You can use a chat function um, in the in the app uh, that you, you use to follow this um, uh, this panel to ask questions to uh, individual uh, panelists or to, to the panel as a whole so do not hesitate using them uh, so two rounds of discussion first what uh, should be disclosed and the second round uh, how should it be disclosed so yesterday we heard that uh, there is a lot of good intentions out there to move towards a greener financial system, uh, a financial system that would allocate capital towards uh, greening the production in the economy. And a clear example of this momentum uh, came in one uh, uh, of the panels yesterday uh, with uh, the possibility that uh, we passed a tipping point uh, whereby, you know, before this, uh, before a few months ago, the stigma would be more on the side of firms who uh, are disclosing about their business model and how the business model may be impacted by uh, higher carbon prices. Um, now, you know, the stigma may have, may have changed camp and uh, may actually be more on the side of firms who are not disclosing enough about the strategies uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. So this, this is a, an important point. Uh, an, an important stage towards greening the, the, the financial system uh, with respect to disclosure. Also, 2021 is a very important year uh, because uh, we see a lot of uh, um, energy which is put towards uh, the emergence of uh, global standards, and, and, and that's something that the panelists will, will, will cover. Uh, however, uh, when it comes to defining global standards, 
the BIS uh, knows all too well that uh, such discussions uh, between different jurisdictions can take time and uh, can be uh, very difficult. Against this background, uh, some, like Al Gore, uh, in his intervention yesterday, stressed uh, uh, the possibility of a regime of radical transparency, uh, whereby NGOs and investors would uh, take the initiatives to uh, find out more about who is committed to reduce the carbon emissions and who is not committed to carbon emissions, uh, stressing that uh, we will be in an era where nobody can hide. So with this in mind, let's just plunge into our subject matter, metrics for the disclosure of corporates. And first thing first, what uh, should be disclosed? Let me give the floor to Rémi uh, Briand, who will uh, introduce uh, the discussion uh, among our three panelists. Okay, th thank you, Benoit. Uh, and, and clearly with, with regards to uh, the disclosure question, um, we first we do support the efforts um, that, you know, in particular TCFD, but also the IFRS, IOSCO uh, group is um, uh, is spearheading to get to a, a common standard of disclosure, because really at this stage, what we feel having you know, looked at a fairly broad universe of company, what we uh, need the most is actually numbers more than qualitative metrics. So, so this element of being a little bit more quantitative in the requirement we feel is, is very important, including some of the most basic component that are the core ingredient of any analysis, which is the scope one, two, and three uh, emission to, to give a sense. If you take the universe of large, mid, and small cap in developed and emerging market, which is the ACQUI IMI index, it's roughly 10,000 companies. Today, 40% uh, of the companies in this universe are disclosing scope one and two, and only 20% uh, uh, are disclosing uh, scope three. Uh, so you could see the glass half full of half empty, but right now in aggregate, it's a little bit more empty than, than full. And, and in particular, scope one and two are, are again, uh, relatively basic ingredients. So, so that's an element that we think should be mandatory in any you know, uh, uh, framework because it's the basic ingredient. Uh, then from there, clearly there are more sophisticated elements that you know should be incorporated in a discussion between you know, in particular a shareholder and, and a company and, and we believe that the targets um, about you know, net zero targets as well as generally the alignment with a 1.5 or 2 degree uh, trajectory will be at the center of this dialogue uh, going forward but again without the core ingredient uh, it's a lot of talk and not a lot of precise analysis, and I think that's really what we need at this stage. So maybe I'll stop here. I'm sure uh, Olivia and Herman would have uh, also views on this. Yes. So, so Herman, uh, maybe you know uh, the, we, we we are all in this, but if you can uh, re remind the audience, uh, scope one, scope two, and scope three, what they are, and uh, and and then uh, build on on uh, or elaborate uh, on this. Uh, you know, what should be uh, disclosed uh, following uh, what uh, Remy has stressed. Yeah, no, of course, thank, and thank you, Benoit, for, for having me. It's, it's an honor to be a part of this uh, event and this panel. And um, also, I think um, Remy also set the scene a little bit in terms of numbers. We also did some, some research, which we published on Earth Day in April, and it, it showed that less than one in four of the world's biggest company are on course to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees. One in four, right? So I think that is quite um, alarming in a way. Um, so you say, you say large companies, can you, you, what do you mean here? Yeah, sure. Those are sort of the, um, if you look at sort of the, the biggest companies of the, 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 the top 14 global indices, uh, that was sort of the universe we we looked at, and um, the number came out was was one in four. Um, and four. And similarly, looking at that universe and based on a temperature score data model, it shows that fifteen percent of the companies, you know, um, are not publicly disclosing their GHG emission standards, which equates to uh, about five trillion dollars. So that that is uh, substantial. 
Um, the European companies are, are leading the way, uh, if you compare that to the US and Asia Pacific. Um, and, and also, if you, if you look at the research done we've, in between, we've, we've done uh, as well between 2014 and 2019 using the temperature score data, um, we could see that um, uh, the companies disclosing at least scope one and two emission rose by 25%. So, I mean, that's encouraging, right? It's going in the right direction. But still, a lot needs to be done to keep the 1.5 degree goal within, within our reach. And, and we, we're not there yet. So I think, you know, the question is, what should we do about that, right? And, and I think, uh, and Benoit, mentioned, uh, sorry, Remy mentioned that already as well, briefly. But, but I believe that um, the TCFD would be a really good candidate to become the mandatory gold standard globally, right? And it, I think it's, um, it was launched by, um, you know, uh, is, is from a voluntary initiative led by Mike Bloomberg and, and Mark Carney as being um, broadly embraced, I think, which is, is a good sign. But there's also, I think, something is missing. And that I would say that there are no explicit mention of targets in the, in the framework. And I think we can't win the race to net zero without short-term and long-term targets. Um, it's interesting, I got an email today from the TCFD uh, um, basically requesting for um, a consultation document for guidance where they're looking at metrics and targets and transition path, pathways. So I think, you know, I, I've, I, I, I have good hope that they will improve that and incorporate that in, in their framework, but I think that it would be um, a helpful uh, improvement for the, for the industry. And for example, if you com compare that with the UN convened the Net Zero 2050 Asset Owner Alliance, which they also published their, um, their guidance for, for uh, institutional investors, how to incorporate um, climate risk across all asset classes. And they clearly came with, uh, uh, you know, this guidance, how much you should re reduce your, your, your carbon emissions in your investments portfolio uh, over the short term uh, and the long term. And I think that is helpful, I think, for investors, but it would be more effective if corporates would also embrace science-based targets, like, for example, the SBTI, right? And, and that is, I think, uh, it's growing, um, but, but and these things are all going in the right direction and they're all sort of driven voluntarily bottom up and, and promoted by NGOs. But I think this is also a moment where the regulators and, and, and policymakers should step in to accelerate the process, right? We've came quite a long way over the last few years, um, made a lot of progress, but you can't just do it only by yourself as corporates or investors. We need regulators and policymakers uh, to step in and to help the process and to set global st standards and to move to move forward in a, in, a, in a faster pace because the clock is ticking, right? And I think that is not realized so much by everyone, but it is definitely click, uh, ticking, this clock. And, and, uh, and let me also make a little comment on, this is not a relative game, right? This is not about emissions expressed in, you know, per dollar revenue. It's actually an, it, it's an absolute race, right? There is a biophysical limit which we call the global carbon budget, right? Where we collectively should, should not exceed this budget before 2050. And I think I just finished reading uh, Breaking Boundaries, The Science of Our Planets, which was written by uh, uh, Johan Rockstrom and, uh, and Owen Gaffney. And um, it will be published as a doc documentary on Netflix on, on actually tomorrow, 4th of June. And I would really recommend this audience to either read the book or, or uh, look at the doc documentary or, or do both because it, it really helps you to understand sort of what this, this means, right? And it is quite uh, impactful to get this sort of message clearly uh, explained in, 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 you know, readable English, which is uh, accessible for everyone. And, and, it, and it becomes clear that it is a race and it becomes clear it's an absolute target we're aiming for and not a relative target. So that is something I think uh, to keep in mind here. And, and the bottom line, let me say that we will not win the race to net zero by 2050 without mandatory disclosure or emission data and explicit reduction targets. We need them both. Let me, let me stop here. So, so let me try to, 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 to summarize uh, where we are and also to, 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 to put what you said in, in the context uh, of uh, uh, the, you know, this race. So we have a, a carbon budget and uh, what we are describing here is how corporates 
uh, would um, uh, disclose uh, where they are today in terms of carbon emissions. And if you make the sum of all the carbon emissions by all the firms, basically you get to a, a, a very large share of the carbon emissions which are, uh, which are uh, basically um, uh, going into the atmosphere. They are also the ones which are coming from households uh, through the consumption, uh, through their, the, 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 the housing, um, that's also a part of it. But uh, what we're discussing here is basically the disclosure by corporates of targets on their carbon emissions. And uh, we are asking uh, how corporates would disclose their objective to reduce the carbon emissions so that together, uh, when we sum all the carbon emissions by all the corporates, uh, we are getting within this carbon budget that we have for the planet that Herman uh, mentioned. And, uh, and Herman is, is, uh, is doing uh, pedagogy by uh, ad advertising this, uh, this documentary tomorrow on, on Netflix. But it did not answer my question on explaining what scope one, scope two, and scope three are, which gives an opportunity to Olivier to, uh, to, to do that for the audience uh, and, 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 and complement on what... Uh, um, Herman uh, and, and, and Remy uh, said uh, up to now. You unmute Oli Olivier. Can you? Yeah. No. Will allow me to just uh, express uh, a couple of general considerations be before going into the details of scope one, two, and three. Um, I, I would like to make sure that we all have, it, all have in mind that this is about risks. Risks for the planet, risks for countries, risks for investors and banks, say the financial ecosystem at large, and risk for companies. And the good thing is, by taking the company angle, we can aggregate everything, which is much harder if we try to start from another side of the global economy. The financial institutions and the investors are often uh, designated as the villains of the climate problem because they have been financing and they keep to some extent financing projects which involve uh, carbon emissions or if we put it even more radically, because they do not only finance projects that will be solutions for the climate. The risk is for every level, and if we tackle it at the company level, we are on the right way. And that is why we are saying that companies should make disclosures. Now, the issue of uh, the, 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 the carbon price. If we put a carbon price, and we have the data released by the companies, we can have public policies that will penalize the carbon emissions. That will be absolutely crucial. Now on scopes one, two, and three. Um, scope one, this is the emissions that result from what is done directly within the company. Scope two, this is the energy and heat which is purchased by the company. So in other words, the uh, carbon emissions take place at the utility generating your heat and your electricity. And scope three, it's two very different animals, actually. Upstream, this is the other inputs that the company has purchased on the market. So between two and three, actually, we separate between energy consumption and the other types of purchases made by the company among its uh, providers. But we have a very different animal with scope three downstream, which is the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions resulting from the use of the products and services made by the companies by uh, their purchasers, by their end users. And here I would say, I think we must demand that companies should report uh, their scope one, their scope two, and their scope three upstream, definitely, but it's a different kettle of fish with scope three downstream because it will be very much a function of what the consumer will do with the, per the service or 
the the good he purchased say uh you you buy a uh car uh there is a lot of greenhouse gas incorporated in producing it that is true but then if you keep it in the garage and you look at it that's one thing but it will not generate much emissions uh if you drive a lot that will be a very different proposition and the company manufacturing the car cannot be held responsible for the type of usage that will be made by the consumer, which takes us back to the importance of a price for the offense that we commit against the climate, that each company commits against the climate or that each end user commits against the climate. And here, um, the, the, the carbon price is a nice, clean solution. Why? Because once we have the data available about uh, carbon emissions, all we need to do is to put a price on carbon. Even more, something even simpler actually we could do. We identify the energy sources that generate uh, carbon emissions and we tax them. And then we don't have to make very complex um, inter-industrial uh, calculations inputs how much there is in each good like the plan like the, the the plan the ghost plan that we had in the communist regimes which eventually was proved to not work we don't have to put all these uh entrants into very complex matrix the price will do the wonders of the market economy it will convey information without you even knowing where it comes from and here i would like to make a mention to a old initiative uh, which uh, unfortunately is uh, not quite back uh, on the fore, uh, and it came from the US. Uh, we remember the initiative, I think it dates back to 2014. It was then called a populist uh, carbon tax, and it was led by prominent, uh, prominent figures from the Republican and Democrat party like uh, George Shultz and James Baker. And what did the, these guys say they said we uh want to create a carbon tax of course we know that as such it's a regressive tax because as a proportion of their total income the uh, poor people will be much more affected than the rich but there is a second leg to it rather than the money collected going to the general funds of the treasury it will be redistributed exactly all the money collected will be redistributed to all the individuals on the one head one share in this amount of money and as a result with this second leg it's no longer regressive it's progressive no gilet jaune without uh, with this no uh, yellow jackets on the contrary the people will get to the street and say we want you to to hike the tax please save the planet and our wallets by the way anyway um now um having said that we we need to make a distinction between scope three upstream and downstream and we we need uh the carbon price to put uh, uh the reality of the price signal in the general economy and at the company level i would like to just make one last point in this chapter how we um will measure uh, the intensities. Um, I think when we do uh, emissions as a proportion of uh, the market value of a company, be it uh, market cap or enterprise value, we're not going in the right direction. It has to be as a function of the company turnover, but this is not enough. It should also be expressed in terms of quantities so for solids that will be tons or kilos if you like and for gas and liquids it will be liters and cubic meters because i think the uh, esg analysts can do a lot of things good things with these uh, datas and they need to be uh, revealed precisely and when you give as a, a proportion of the turnover it uh, opacifies potentially a bit so just go down to the raw data. The company has it, the raw data, give it to the uh, investors and to the whole investing community. And uh, this uh, will help the um, ESG analysts uh, measure 
properly the risks just as much as the financial analysts will have measured the risks on the financials. And as we know, uh, from the risk side, uh, ESG is the risk, the financial risk of the future. And of course, I'm, I'm aware there is the very strong uh, ethical dimension. I am all for it, but this is an individual matter. We cannot demand that uh, a full ecosystem transform itself into a charity or an endowment. That is not the way the private uh, economy functions, the capitalist system functions, and we have not invented some, something much better so far. So uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Olivier. So I, I think Remy and, and Herman will be also with you that, uh, that we want uh, to obtain more data disclosed by corporates. So just to, to summarize, um, uh, in terms of the indices uh, that can be used, you know, the metrics uh, that can be used. So we are talking about scope one, scope two, and, and, and scope two and scope three with, uh, with uh, downstream uh, scope three, uh, you know, there is an open debate uh, how much we can uh, hold the, 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 the firm uh, responsible for it. Even if I assume in the, in the case of large companies that uh, you, can, you could apply the law of large number to find out how much on average people are going to drive their car uh, to, 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 to define this. But maybe it, it, it's going to be more difficult for your. Uh, so you make the distinction between the carbon emissions. So the carbon intensity would be carbon emissions divided by the turnover. So, you know, it's a, uh, a level of carbon divided, say, by uh, millions of dollars or euros. And you also ask that uh, this would be this, this carbon intensity is defined uh, at the physical level product, which I trust you, 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 you believe can be done even for corporates who, are, who have multi products. So, you know, if I take the example of, of Apple, they have computers, uh, uh, Apple Watch and, uh, and, and iPads uh, and servers. And, and yet, you know, they, they have a way to, to, to define the intensity of each of these products so that uh, investors can look into their, their, their business models. Uh, I see first I give the floor to Remy, then back to Olivier and then to, to Herman. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to compliment some um, of um, what, you know, Olivier was, was highlighting um, and, and maybe also getting back to one of Herman's points. So um, on the emission, I think we need both the absolute and the relative metrics, you know, it, because I 100% agree with Herman's view that at the end of the day, it's not a relative question. <laughs> we have to get the absolute number of emission down. Uh, but clearly, when you start thinking about how to allocate, for example, a fair share of the budget to companies, then you have to have a mechanism uh, to take into account, you know, their relative size, because, you know, uh, you, you have to do that exercise. And that's where the, the relative metric on intensity that Olivier is highlighting is necessary. But, but I, I think we should not forget sort of the end goal, which is, which is to reduce the absolute emission. Because one of the drawbacks of only looking at, at relative intensity is that uh, you, you can actually decrease your intensity, but because you're growing your production, you still emit more. And that's one of the issues we're seeing in the uh, oil and gas sector today as an example. So, so that's one, one component. And then maybe uh, uh, going back to the scope three um, you know, downstream uh, uh, effect, which is, uh, maybe one that is, um, in a sense, a bit more complicated uh, to to model or to disclose, but still, um, even from a pure risk assessment perspective, we think it's important to have uh, an assessment of the scope three. If you take, for example, again, an, an, oil, an oil pipeline or a gas pipeline, it has very little emission uh, until you get to the product itself, uh, which you know, is carried through the pipeline. And so if you analyze the transition risk of, of these types of activities, then clearly you would want to uh, minimize your exposure to oil and gas pipeline, you know, if you want to <laughs> minimize generally your, um, you know, your risk in this area. So, so it may be a bit more difficult, but we think it's worth the effort to try to get also to uh, downstream scope three. Thank you, Remy. Olivier, I give you the, the floor back and then Herman. Very, very quickly anyway, uh, I think we fully agree. 
and on scope 3 downstream yes it has to be published uh, simply i believe it's not fair to tax a company for the downstream emissions uh, it's a map it's a, a number which is super useful to assess the risks for the company the transition risks for the company but it is probably a bit unfair to charge the companies for them you charge the consumer the consumer when they use their car they pay for the petrol and so on and so on so that that is totally reconcilable what we have been saying in this respect and uh, uh we have not mentioned the issue of scenarios maybe it is at this point that we could and not in the second part of the discussion but if we talk about scenarios i think risk wise again it is super important to help the market uh, figure out what is the transition risk implied by this and that company and uh, the best way is to say well tell us uh, what is the pnl impact for you guys um, if uh, the price of carbon is 50 uh, now which by the way it is in in europe and in other jurisdictions it went uh, quite nicely up recently if it is 100 and i would be adamant that we should also point out uh, 150 if not for 2025 certainly for 2030 so we give analysts the uh, tools to assess how much of a transition risk there is in a company and here the scope 3 downstream will be uh, a, a tool in in this assessment as well because uh, if it becomes very expensive for the consumer to use something probably the demand for such products will go down Yes, so actually I was going to, to, to try to, to clarify the, 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 the point that you made or at least illustrate it uh, um, that uh, effectively uh, say you have a price of carbon of, uh, of, of 200 and if you are producing uh, a product which is going to use a lot of energy uh, by the consumers um, and uh, uh, they are impacted through this much higher price of carbon which would be $200 per ton for instance uh, in your um, in your investment plans uh, as a corporate, you should factor in that the demand for such products is likely to be much lower uh, given that uh, carbon prices would be higher. So even though you know, you're not penalized directly uh, for the down downstream uh, scope three, you would be pen penalized because you take into account that the demand for your product that will consume a lot of carbon would be would uh, would probably go down so uh, that's uh, that's uh, very 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 clear and very useful uh, uh, Olivier uh, Herman you want to add something at, at this stage yeah sure I, I, and first of all I would agree with Remy about that relative uh, measurement is of course important right I'm not saying we should we should get rid of that but the reality is that our emissions are still increasing Right, and so going to net zero, try to sort of picture that, that is actually going all the way to net zero, right? And if you're still rising, although we're rising maybe, you know, slower, um, but it, it's still going up, right? So it, it, we need to get sort of, uh, I think, uh, a reality check that we need to move actually to declining emissions instead of rising slower, right? And, and because we need to actually create a tipping point to re reduction of emissions. And uh, if you focus too much on relative, you, you just forget that in, in a way. And that's why I sort of uh, highlight a little bit about focusing on absolute emissions, not only from corporates, from, from everyone, agriculture, consumers, the entire society, right? So that's one point. So secondly, I am all in favor of pricing what econ economists call externalities, right? This is the stuff we forgot to put in our models, and now we realize that we have to put it back in our models because it's usually impact the world, right? We forgot to, how to, you know, and so I think pricing externalities is critical, not only for carbon, but basically for your entire um, uh, footprint as a company, because you need to understand, and you can only express it in money because that is how the capitalism system is working. You need to understand what the impact is of your footprint, right? And, then, and, and not only today, because if you, if you take a snapshot of your emissions today, that's interesting but more interesting is actually the, the trend how was it how did it sort of how was the trend sort of uh, developing over the years but as an investor and i think uh, for and also for for regulators what's much more important is what is your what are your plans concrete plans 
in terms of managing to, towards a net zero 2050 end goal, right? So I'm coming back to the science-based targets. That's really relevant because then you talk about the future. And we want to see that the trends, and if we take snapshots every quarter of emission data, we want to make sure that the trend is sort of following what they promised in their science-based targets, right? And, and that, I think, is forward-looking, and that will drive uh, valuations of companies. I mean, as an investor, I'm not, not, not so much interested in sort of the P and, uh, analyzing the P&L of last year. It's much more about forward-looking. What's, what's, you know, what is the range of scenarios that could happen with these companies? And do they really understand their, their, their entire footprint in terms of, you know, implicit cost on society? Because one, one thing we know for sure, that the threshold will go up for companies to manage that uh, more effectively because it's, it's, a, it, it's, ne it's just necessary. We can't continue like this forever. And I think that the science has proven that, um, you know, uh, extensively. So that is, I think that's really important, uh, much more focused on the, on, on, on the forward-looking uh, data and information for, for investors and for, for regulators to understand uh, the risk of this, this company. Um, because, that, again, that will drive the, the valuations of, of, of today. So I think those are the, the, the two things I would like to add. And maybe one last comment, if I may, Benoit, on the, the point on radical transparency what uh, was promoted by uh, Al Gore. I I'm all in favor of that. I think that is really critical to achieve that um, because it deals with the greenwashing, it deals with so many issues. And the good thing is, there's, a, I think, a very positive development that if you look at currently how much alternative data and non-financial data we, we are collecting uh, as an industry already, uh, coming from satellites, all kinds of different things, and if you look at what I call the datafication uh, in society, that we're going to sort of measure about pretty much everything, and the digitization of, the, of, that, of that data, and, and looking at applications like AI and, and machine learning and all that stuff, then basically we are getting closer to transparency and measuring radical transparencies. And then you, you can't get away with the greenwashing anymore because in a way the, the machines will, 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 you know, will find out if the emperor is wearing any clothes or not, right? And, and, and we're not that far away from that. So um, technology will definitely be a driver. Alternative data technology will be definitely a driver to reach this more transparency across the board. So that, that's, uh, that's uh, a very positive uh, view on what technology can, can bring us in this race uh, uh, towards greening the, the, the economy. And, and, you know, it's good that... Uh, uh, it brings uh, it, it brings solutions, um, but before you know, before going into the, the issue about data, which will be more uh, the second part of our discussion on you know how uh, how uh, to, to to do the disclosure. You know, I'd like to come back to 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 a point and, and ask also uh, Olivier and Remy about a dimension that you you just mentioned, uh, Herman, uh, that relates to. Um, precisely the plan, okay, the planning of corporates. So uh, they are making plans. Uh, some of them uh, have targets. Uh, and if we, if we look, for instance, at what uh, uh, Climate uh, Action 100 Plus, uh, which is uh, an initiative that gathers um, investors who together invest something like 54 trillions, uh, and, and so, you know, their approach has been to engage with, uh, so far, about 170 very, very large um, corporations, uh, which are, you know, the big polluters, the guys who emit a lot of carbon. Uh, these 170 firms together account for something like 80% of carbon emissions by corporates. So, you know, when you have 54 trillions, uh, you are very, uh, you know, the, the, the management of those large firms, uh, they have time for you. You know, they can invest time uh, to explain to you what you are, uh, you know, what you are trying uh, to do, uh, what the, the corporation is trying to do, its uh, target emissions, uh, you know, the, and, and when the company is going to say to investors, um, uh, professional investors uh, who represent, you know, this huge, uh, amount of, uh, of of investment, how they will get to say divide their carbon emission within ten years, uh, with those professional investors, 
um, you can have an in-depth uh, analysis of the strategy, um, an assessment of its credibility, and, uh, and, and this is precisely very important uh, for this strategy to be credible for investors who have a long horizon and to be consistent with this, uh, you know, this, this uh, carbon budget that we have at the level of the planet. Okay, uh, but what they can do for these very large corporations, uh, which involve uh, you know hours of discussion with the management of those firms, assessing you know where will they invest, uh, what type of investment they will make to transform their production processes, um, what is the strategy, is it credible, uh, you know, can this be replicated? And you know that's very much the topic of this uh, of this panel. Um, do you see our corporations that would be like you know much smaller? Um, uh, what should we expect uh, them to be able to disclose? Um, uh, what should be mandatory for the disclosure uh, so that uh, investors uh, can make an assessment of the credibility of their plans to reduce their carbon emissions? Uh, do you guys have, uh, have views on that? I know that you're very familiar with uh, uh, this approach uh, uh, and, and the assessment, for instance, on the quality of, uh, of corporate governance, uh, of the governance of those targets, which is assessed, for instance, by the, 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 tran the, the Transition Pathway uh, Initiative. Uh, and actually, um, Climate 100 Plus is using an assessment which is done by transition pathway initiative in terms of the quality uh, and the credibility of these uh, 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 of these plans to reduce carbon and just to give a, a very illustrative uh, uh, example of one of the cr criteria of uh, climate uh, 100 um, climate action 100 plus they request that uh, the usage of uh, you know the the money which is invested into lobbying and the purpose of the lobbying of the firms is disclosed. You know, that's, uh, they, they take this as a, a, a very strong signal that uh, the, 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 you know, the management is not just talking with investors and trying to do greenwashing on the one hand, and on the other hand is lobbying with governments for, uh, to make sure that uh, mandatory disclosure would not become, for instance, uh, very stringent. So what, what do you think we can learn from uh, f from those initiatives, which engage with very large corporations, where um, large investors can engage with management, but for many investors, you know, you just want a, a rating. If you make the, the parallel with uh, credit risk, uh, the only thing that uh, many investors are looking at is, okay, is it triple B or is it double A or uh, uh, is that uh, is it only double B? Um, do you, do you guys have, have, have views on how we can progress here? And, and, and what is it that you would like, you know, the, the one thing that if you could choose uh, what is included in the core uh, mandatory disclosure uh, of corporates, okay, that would apply, say, to any public firms. I'm not talking even of SMEs, just to any public firms. What would, would you really insist to see in this disclosure? Who wants to go first? Remy. Yes. Um, so but before I answer to purely the disclosure part, maybe it's worth sort of making a clarification that the disclosure is a very important component. But as of today, it's not an inhibitor to making an analysis. So, so, so for, for example, I think we're the analogy might be that today, you know, if there would be no accounting standard and the company would not report their revenues and profit, there would be still a lot of people, you know, looking at satellite data to measure the traffic on the shopping mall to infer, you know, the revenues of company. Um, so, and that's what we're doing, you know, effectively on this topic where, you know, if there is no um, uh, information disclosed by the company, we model them and we use, you know, this alternative data. But that doesn't mean that it's not good to actually have 
also uh, a disclosure by by company so 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 we we need i think to distinguish between the need for disclosure which would improve the transparency across the board would refine the precision of the assessment that is being done but you know it's it's our experience now for the last decade that that you know you cannot wait for perfect disclosure otherwise you would have done nothing for the last you know 10 years and so you need this modeling part you need this alternative data and right now i think we're at a stage where even if the models are imperfect they're still actionable in terms of either assessing the risk or uh, driving the the engagement and and personally, I don't think that there is, from a, a, a measurement standpoint, necessarily a distinction between, um, you know, you, you may have to have the same analysis to drive, if you want, two outcomes in terms of what you do with the analysis or the, or, or the models or the metrics. One is assessing the risk and the other one is engaging uh, with companies. But sometimes I think we're conflating the two in a sense that um, if, if you take the example of a coal company, you know, you do the analysis, you know, um, of, you know, the, the future projections, you know, in terms of the need for the product, you know, coal, and, and the risk assessment may lead you to just, you know, conclude that it's hopeless, right? That you don't, you know, in any shape or form, you will not need coal going forward, and that's the risk assessment. Then in the case of coal, then you have the, tricky question whether it's even worth engaging with you know a company that you know whose purpose in life is digging coal to consume it you know and and do emission and you may just conclude that you know banning any funding you know is actually a better outcome so 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 the risk assessment you know should drive in most of the uh, you know in most of the cases should drive in an engagement for a transition but you know in certain cases you may just conclude that you know uh, uh, completely getting away from financing you know those activities actually a better outcomes so. so so to answer your question on the necessary you know metrics uh, so we discussed i think so far quite a lot you know the the various scopes what we haven't touched and 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 i also you know strongly believe that the targets are a key component so that you get from the current assessment of emission to a projection uh, of, of the emission. Um, um, and, and there is a lot to be done in standardizing how targets should be disclosed because today, um, you know, the situation is that it's really all over the place. You know, you, you have companies that disclose, for example, scope three but take out their Asian operation because, you know, probably they're not as good as the European one. You know, it's, it's, that's the reality of, of the current situation in terms of disclosure. So, so I think there, there is a need to um, uh, assess the targets uh, and over time to standardize, you know, the way they should be disclosed so that we avoid this type of sort of misleading, you know, a, a statement. So targets are important, but we haven't discussed physical risk so far, which, you know, in, in, in our mind is, is, is something that needs to be assessed, at least from a, a risk assessment standpoint. And there, the basic ingredient, if you want to do the sophisticated analysis on, on, on physical risk, the, the basic ingredient is about facilities, location, buildings, etc. And, and that's where, again, uh, you know, the disclosure of maybe the most critical facilities of a company might be uh, an, an interesting disclosure. Today, again, we compensate, right? So what we do is we search, you know, the web for locations of company. We use all types of databases to create this. But again, it's it's a substitute, you know, to a, a, a better disclosure if if need be. And maybe the last point on what could be desirable feature in terms of disclosure would be supply chain element. So so again, um, you know, when you analyze physical risk or transition risk, but just take the example of physical risk, um, you know, if if you have um, a long supply chain, you know your risk, you know, might of disruption might be in the supply chain, not so much in your main, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, factory that could be well protected. So, so again, having a bit more transparency on the top supplier 
of each company would, I think, help a lot in, in having a more precise and more transparency, much more precise assessment of, uh, of both physical and transition risk. Thank you, Remy. Uh, you know, given you, you, you started uh, mentioning physical risk and, and uh, Herman earlier uh, mentioned data datafication. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure how to, to, to pronounce it, but uh, you know the increasing use of data. I mean, some people say data is a new oil, and uh, and and there's a lot of data going around uh, uh, going around the assessment of those risks, uh, both the transition and risk. But now uh, we we can also uh, open the chapter of physical risk, um, and uh, and so Herman, where where do you where do you think the data gap is uh, biggest? Uh, is it on the transition risk or, or or on the physical risk, or do you feel that on the physical risk, given the the current means that we have to uh, look at the planet using satellites uh, uh, and use, using the internet, as Remy mentioned, mm -hmm. that uh, you you're fairly confident that uh, um, investors or or uh, specialized agencies can bring about uh, and 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 the, uh, a good assessment mm -hmm. of uh, of physical risks. Yeah. So let me point out a few things here uh, and and. Um, First of all, if there are no standards or um, disclosure requirements, we'll go into this massive workaround where we figure out with all kinds of smart ways to find data here and there and put it together in a model, et cetera, et cetera, which is which what we're doing currently, right? Because there are, there are no standards yet set. And although there are many standards available, I think it is something like 15 different standards already are, are out there. I would say pick one or two, Right, and which you use then for uh, um, for co for corporates to to disclose their their all their reporting needs. For example, I think what WEF came out uh, September last year with I think it's called um, stakeholder capitalism, and they worked with the big four audit firms and they looked at all the different uh, um, sort of standards and they tried to sort of harmonize it, including the SDGs and GRI and SESP and came up with sort of um, intuitively, I think, uh, an interesting approach, which was really at the high level about governance, people, planet, and prosperity. And then, of course, you had subsectors. And so, so if, if companies start to report along these things, that would be uh, helpful because then you get a much more standardized uh, approach and, it, and, and, and actually you bring it into the into the systems and it like it becomes like financial uh, reporting and analysis because it is a whole process behind it which is audited and it's under the remit of the CFO and, and so you, you actually bring the two worlds of alternative data financial data you bring it together if you start using standards and if you start using mandatory uh, disclosure for corporates uh, as long as we, did, we don't have that we are doing what we're currently doing because that's the best thing we can do um, secondly, I would say on the physical risk is very challenging uh, to get uh, good data uh, available. There are just less than a handful of commercial providers uh, who specialize in this space. Um, it's highly fragmented. It is behind uh, uh, thick walls like you know agencies, science labs, research companies, NASA, uh, the Ministry of Defense. Uh, universities and and I think it would be really helpful for the market to actually make this data more transparent and accessible and I, also I think if I were a regulator I would be highly interested in this risk because if you look at the value of the total real estate in, in uh, globally it's much higher than global equity markets right and so that's something where we think where I think we have a massive gap and of course Many companies are, are in the data business are, are making good attempts to, you know, as a first step. But um, we need to sort of break down these walls, right? We need to have access to this data. And it should be, again, it's something like a, uh, it has a public function because it is about the risk management of, of society, right? Regulators need to understand it. Investors need to understand it. Corporates need to understand it. And definitely insurance companies. And they have, of course, a lot of proprietary information because it's their core business. So I have to, they have a lot of data, but it, that data is not available for the marketplace. So I, I think that there is um, still a long way to go on the physical risk side to um, make improvements. Um, you can also 
ask corporates to disclose physical risk data, and then it, it becomes maybe maybe that's a solution. But we're currently having is is I would say fairly poor. We are quite more advanced on the transition risk to measure that, and we did a lot of work uh, on that, which is good. On the physical risk, not so not 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 a great job so far, I would argue. There's there's still a way to go. I mean, that's sort of yeah, what my I would sort of share. Thank you. So so Olivier, uh, do you own a lot of real estate? Uh, in a uh, fond de réserve des retraites that uh, you worried about in terms of, uh, of physical risk uh, and and how do you see uh, you, how do you see this from from your viewpoint with this long horizon you have a very long horizon as an investor uh, and uh, and so there in terms of, of, of physical risk how how relevant is this for you uh, and and how do you see, see this uh, uh, um, evolving uh, and and what type of disclosure would be most helpful for, from your standpoint with this uh, long-term uh, value objectives even indirectly mute, Oliver. Olivia. Oh. no 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 it's just that there's a delay in the sorry okay. so we don't own much uh, real estate uh, directly or indirectly in the portfolio um, that's a, a fact. It's a consequence of our investment horizon, which unfortunately is not as long as we would like. Uh, you don't buy forest uh, for 10 or 15 years. Uh, you buy them for probably 30 to 50 years, which is longer than our investment horizon. So in, in a way, we are good guys trying to do better on ESG and the climate side than would be strictly implied by the duration of our liabilities. But that's another story. I'm not here to complain about our, the duration of our liabilities. Um, but I would also like to, to pick up uh, briefly on uh, the remarks made uh, previously and uh, the very short remark is, I very much agree with uh, what um, Herman and Remy said. Uh, engagement, yes, indeed, but in some cases it's hopeless. Uh, to, uh, Remy mentioned coal, tobacco for us, for example. We say, don't waste your time, don't engage tobacco companies just exclude them which is what we do and we also see uh, merits in models but the crucial point now is to improve disclosure of course ESG and climate related analysis had to take place and a lot of it had to be based on models when the data was scarce and uh, not harmonized and it is still to a large extent scarce and not harmonized but we are pushing and that's why we want compulsory disclosures in several fields of um, transition-related and physical-related risks. And here, uh, besides the uh, global uh, the greenhouse gas emissions on a relative and on an absolute uh, basis, of course. And by the way, I love the expenses in lobbying that should be disclosed. And if any of these is not, that's fraud just in the same way as it should be the case for financing political parties. And uh, the path for um, emissions is also very crucial. And uh, so saying how much uh, this company plans to emit in terms of carbon and other related uh, 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 greenhouse gases, that is crucial. And it's actually the uh, better element uh, when compared with the projected uh, turnover and p &L sensitivity to the trajectory of carbon price, because then we also need to know the methodology employed by the company. But if they give both the uh, amount of gases that they plan to emit over the next uh, 10 or 15 years, or at least five years, and uh, sensitivities on their turnover and their p &L, that will massively help the investment community and the analysts on uh, ESG, which is, as I said previously, a uh, necessary element to assess profitability on a sustainable path. On physical risk, indeed, um, it's much more difficult to get the data. And here, the uh, proxy using uh, satellite images and so on is of, of interest. Um, but maybe just asking companies to report what are their main physical risks uh, to certain uh, um, environmental events like uh, special droughts 
like uh, special uh, heavy rains, uh, like uh, the rise in uh, sea levels, uh, you would cover a lot of that. I have to say, I think on the rise of the sea level, in the sea level, it is very much a country risk issue. It, uh, you, you take Bangladesh, for example, or you take the Maldives, it is much more than an individual company story because if a large proportion of the companies in a country are affected as a result of a systemic climatic uh, climate event, then all the companies are in a dire situation because the taxman will be very heavy-handed on those companies not directly affected by the climate situation. And so it really becomes a country problem. And it's much more than that. As we know, it's a migration uh, problem and so on and so on. Uh, I think I will stop here. And fundamentally, I, I support the remarks made by my colleagues. Yes, Remy, uh, a last point on, on we, we still on the what we started to, to touch here and there on the how, but uh, I, then I would like that we move to the how uh, mm. uh, and, and give e each of you uh, uh, three, four minutes and you know, on your views on, on how things should be, uh, how those uh, metrics should be disclosed. But Remy, first, uh, uh, you wanted to, to intervene. Yeah, and I, I wanted just to maybe compliment on a bit on physical risk, but that could be a good segue to also the discussion on, on what. So if, if you look at the current TCFD framework, it, it, it's very comprehensive in terms of the topics to be covered in the analysis, you know, including scenario and, and stress testing, including physical risk. So, so, so maybe one way to think about this all disclosure component is that some of there's one layer which is the, the broad layer, you know, uh, and I think the TCFD framework is 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 a is a good you know a framework to look at the different aspects of uh, of the problem uh, but in certain area there is clearly a need to be very prescriptive in terms of what needs to be disclosed in the inputs and the outputs the ingredients like the scope one two and three and then you know the outputs which could be projections on on emissions uh, you know, implied temperature rise, we think is is a metric that summarizes well sort of where you would fit, you know, as a company or as a, a portfolio or, or the loan book of a bank. So, so those would be more output metrics. And then in certain area and physical risk might be the, the one where um, there is maybe the industry is, is at, the, at the stage where there is still a need for innovation. And so the current framework on TCFD says, you know, you need to look at this risk, but it's not very prescriptive on how to do that. And maybe it's okay on physical risk where, you know, um, we, we can let for a year or two uh, different types of views being expressed on how to assess physical risk. And then as innovation and standard emerge, then we can be more, more prescriptive. But I personally think that um, you know, taking real estate, even if the problem is very complica complicated to model, you know, understanding, you know, if you own buildings in Miami, you need to understand, you know, the, you know, the flooding risk, you know, to start with the hurricane risk. And, and this has already an effect on, on price, right? So when you buy properties in this area, you, you as a buyer, whether professional or personal, you have that in mind. And so, so the models that they exist to assess the risk, the exposure, as well as the, pot the potential damages, they're not perfect, but you know, right now they're already useful, at least in, in our mind. So maybe we're not at a stage where we can define precisely every ingredient, every output, so that there is a, a, an easier comparison to be made you know, across you know, different portfolios. But we, I personally think that it's really important to make an assessment, even if it's not you know, totally standardized at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. So I want to give the floor to Herman on, on the how, because uh, in terms of the data gap uh, and, and what, uh, you know, what data should be in the public domain. And, and uh, uh, you, I, I think you, you, you are very uh, uh, 
very clear view. So, uh, you know, for, for the audience, uh, please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say that if you look at the current ESG data infrastructure today, um, I would argue that it's inadequate to meet our growing transparency needs. Yes, we're making good progress, and it's much better than five years ago, but it's not fit for purpose yet. And um, so I think using technology, I mentioned that earlier, and collaboration uh, will definitely will change that. Um, also, I think the new regulation from the EU around the, the green taxonomy uh, and, and, and other things they just published are, are very helpful. Uh, they're not perfect, but they're a very helpful first step towards regulation and standardization. But it also requires that I think that ESG raw data should be accessible by all stakeholders. Be, like, a, like a public good, right? And, I, and we are building a, a platform to promote that principle um, because I think that is something uh, which is uh, helpful for, for all stakeholders if, the, if that's sort of available. Um, and um, I think that is also one of the things which came out of the EU uh, as a requirement that, that, that raw data should be accessible. Um, and I, I th I th that, makes, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because it, it, I mean, when I was at the UN, we built our entire infrastructure around ESG and we had very different, uh, a range of different data providers and we built the technology in-house and what I call the ESG blender. So we had all kinds of data coming in and try to build the models and, and so it requires resources, people, technology, etc. But if we all have to do that uh, as sort of um, institutional investors and asset managers and, and all the different parties, it's not a very efficient or effective system, right? It's 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 sort of a workaround because it's, because there's the only way to do it, and I think so. There is a better way and um, uh, to do that, and a, plat a platform like that would enable corporates to report against the established reporting frameworks, like you have the GRI, the SESB, TCFD, and then they can manage and map the disclosure requests and answer across multiple reporting frameworks and prioritize the request and the selecting data points. So you get that, that, that engagement function can also be in a, in a, you know, you have the, you just spoke about the Share Action 100 um, uh, plus initiative, which is I think a great initiative, where you have a dialogue and management and everything. And sometimes it's very effective and sometimes less so. But you can also have a, an engagement, um, a way of engagement supported by technology where investors uh, or other stakeholders are requesting to companies using a platform and say, well, you know, we, we don't really understand uh, about your exposure in a certain sector because we're missing data points and it would be helpful if you could sort of provide that, right? So, so it's another way to create transparency and to complement the marketplace uh, to, to, to reach the, the point, uh, El Gore, I like the point El Gore made about the radical transparency. Because the transparency is critical, because you need information to 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 make investment decisions, to to calculate risk management, and 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 those type of things. So I, that I think, in a nutshell, that is sort of the how I. Was, you asked me about how, and this is I think if we build better ESG data infrastructure um, for all stakeholders, that would be a helpful improvement I think towards this objective. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Erman. Uh, Olivier, on, on the how, uh, is there something you, you, you'd like to, to add um, uh, at this stage? And, and uh, you know, maybe in, uh, in two minutes, because then I want to give each of you uh, 90 seconds to, uh, you know, for, for, for the last word, you know, the, the, the point that you really want to stress uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, coalition of the willings uh, towards uh, uh, better uh, financial systems and, and, and where investors can, can choose um, with a better understanding of, uh, of the risks uh, to climate. Yes. Well, um, the uh, efforts that have been carried out so far in terms of disclosure and uh, methodologies and uh, platforms to report and analyze are commendable. But the only proper way forward is mandatory disclosure and i fully agree with herman that this is a public good the raw data has to be made available it is exactly the same stuff as financial data 
uh, all companies listed or not are subjected to reporting obligations. Uh, they are heavier for listed companies on large markets, fair enough. It helps us analyze the financial risks. ESG risks and climate prominently among them is a financial risk. It's just that it's not uh, uh, evident tomorrow in tomorrow's accounts, but in N plus two, N plus three, N plus 10. And for any half decent uh, investor or um, a participant, what happens in 10 years is very relevant. So that needs to be made compulsory, very simple. And raw data, and there needs to be a standardization on the ways and the hows of uh, what you publish and how you do. And there needs to be platforms available for everybody, just as we can access financial data. So that's a very simple thing. Um, rating agencies today, they operate with uh, the raw financial data, which is public, and they transform it and use it the way they see fit to uh, award, a, uh, to grant a mark to a given company on credit risk. The same has to happen for ESG data and climate-related data. Very, very simple in my mind. Thank you, Olivier. That's a very clear uh, conclusion, which uh, actually uh, you are meeting uh, Mark Carney in the conclusion he made yesterday, you know, when he was asked, when will we be able to celebrate? And uh, his answer was, you know, when it will just be part of uh, the normal uh, uh, assessment of risks. Um, and it will be part of what can be assessed uh, in terms of risks by investors. It will be part of their, you know, it will be their bread and butter. And we won't need to, uh, uh, to push for it because it will be already in our practice. So yes, you're in very good company, Olivier, here. Uh, Remy, uh, Herman, you have uh, one, uh, min about one minute each. Uh, so what would you want to, to emphasize? Yeah. Maybe I, I, I can start on even reinforcing, I think, Oliver's, Olivier's point is um, if we follow that logic that it should be equivalent to financial data, then I think we, we not only have a framework, uh, but I think we should um, uh, support the efforts done by IFRS, IOSCO, and TCFD to get precisely there. Uh, and as far as, as the release of the information, uh, we have already placeholders uh, to distribute the financial information. You know, in, in the US, it's the Edgar database. You know, you go there and you get the information. I think in Europe, the commission is working on a similar uh, element. So, so we, in a sense, we need, I think, to reduce the number of initiatives and more concentrate on the ones that have uh, proper governance, proper track record, and and the, and the ability to actually really create those standards. And I think at this stage, uh, it's TCFD, it's IFRS, and and uh, with the backing of IOSCO, that would be our view. Thank you, Remy. Uh, Herman, your your conclusion. Yeah, let me just repeat what I said earlier today. I think, you know, it's all about winning the race to net zero 2050. I mean, that is the race we're talking about, and we should focus on that. And that basically means that we have to reduce our emissions to zero. And the only way to get there, if we have the regulators and the policymakers stepping in and, and, and actually, uh, you know, helping setting uh, standards for mandatory disclosure for corporates um, and financial institutions, on emissions uh, in not only not only the disclosure of sort of uh, historical data but also in terms of science-based targets projections how do the companies uh, are what are the plans of management to reach this objective um, you know in in a sort of a standard way so that we can all assess it and and, and track it and and, and look at it uh, those, I think, the, the two most important um, requirements to, you know, to win this race, because it's going to be very challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Uh, thanks again, uh, Olivier, Rémy. 
we had a, a very good discussion uh, this afternoon, um, and uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, of food for thought. Uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, commonality in, in what you emphasized as, uh, as priorities to, to progress effectively uh, for, uh, um, towards uh, uh, greener finance. So thanks, thanks very much uh, uh, for, for the quality of, uh, of your interventions and uh, also for, for, the, for this uh, uh, very pleasant uh, discussion we had this afternoon. Uh, for, for the audience, uh, the next, uh, the next um, uh, presentation uh, in the Green Swan Conference is by uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin, uh, former Deputy uh, Secretary uh, of the U.S. Uh, Treasury and former governor of uh, the Federal Reserve Board. So I invite you to, to join this uh, as a session which is starting uh, right now. Uh, thank you uh, for being with us uh, this afternoon uh, in Europe, uh, this evening in Asia, and this morning uh, in the Americas. And, uh, and, and, and stay, stay healthy and, uh, and, and follow the next sessions of the Green Swan Conference. A lot to learn still. Thank you very much.